Hey, this is Stu, and I'm at the beautiful Purple Valley, and I'm here with Laruga again. Thanks, Laruga, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, today we're going to do something a little bit special, and we haven't tried this before. What we're going to do is we've filmed Laruga doing the whole of third series, and then we're going to talk over it and explain what's going through our mind and what the difficulties are with the different postures as we're going through. To save you a bit of time, what we're going to do is we're going to cut into it just as she's finished the last uh, standing posture, and then we'll fade out again when we come to the finishing sequence. Otherwise, we'll be going on for about two hours. But if you want to watch the whole thing in its entirety without us talking over the top, that's also going to be available too. So thanks, Laruga. And first of all, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the third series as it relates to the other series. Mm -hmm. And I know we've already sort of talked about the fact of the way that the different uh, series have their own energy. Yes. And can, we, can you just explain that to us again? So, um, kind of like what I was mentioning in the other interview, that uh, if we look at primary series, it definitely has this gradual buildup, a peak at Supta Kurmasana, and then a gradual tapering off. And then with, uh, with intermediate series, there's a few peaks and valleys. Um, you know, usually the peak of Kapotasana yes. or the peak of doing something like a Dewey Padashirsasana and something like a Khandavasana. Like there's these kind of, we're working in these different extremes. Um, and then in third series, it f almost feels like your energy is, you have to command your energy almost throughout. There are a few places that it seems to drop off a little bit, but really it's almost like you have to be on 100% of the time within the sequence. So. And it's funny because I've watched third series a few times on videos mm -hmm. and the guys that are watching are going to see you doing it now and you're going to look like a swan. You're no. going to look like a <laughs> swan going through third series. But actually being there physically watching you when, as it was being filmed, mm. I actually got a real sense of the amount of effort that is going into it much more so than when I watched it. And mm. you really get an appreciation for the sort of unrelenting physicalness of it. All those arm balances down from tripod. Mm. And then uh, there's a few postures in there and we'll talk about as we come to them. That it seems like they're finished and then there's another aspect to it too. It just like becomes even more difficult. Yes. And so how do you... Is it a psychological thing that keeps you going? Or how do you draw upon keeping that energy going? Um, I mean, I think at this po once you make it to this point, it's, it's like you're ready for it to a sense, but that doesn't mean that it's not challenging because it definitely is. I mean, um, in one way, it's what's, what I feel different in Advanced A or in Third Series is that there's certain points in the practice where I actually feel like I'm vibrating. Right. You know, there's a, like a vibration that kind of goes in a little bit deeper into the body that I don't experience in primary series or in intermediate series. Um, and that, that's something that I find kind of fascinating within this practice. Um, it does demand quite a bit of strength. And because of that sense of strength, I know that my challenge is to also to maintain that sense of softness within it. Right. That's really been an important for me that it's not just all push, 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 that I, that I do have this sense of um, balancing the energy that is commanded within this, this sequence. Um, but it is, it's, it's something that really demands your focus and um, your strength throughout the entire practice, I feel, compared to the other The others at sequences. peak and trough. Yeah. And d did you, so how long have you been doing second before you went into mm. third? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I've gone through different cycles because I was introduced to intermediate series before I even arrived to, to Mysore, my right. first trip, um, to, to uh, practice with Sharat. And, um, um, and even I was introduced to some of the third series positions. Okay. But when I started to practice in Mysore, then I kind of started all over. They take them away again, don't they? Yeah, yeah. and you just kind of rebuild <laughs> yeah. everything. So, I, you know, I haven't really counted the, the amount of years, but I, I mean, I've spent a solid amount of years in primary as well as in intermediate series. Yeah. Um, I know, like, you know, a lot of practitioners get into this sense of, like, more is better as fast as possible, but I have found that... Um, the time that I've taken in primary and in intermediate series and not rushing the process too fast has actually given me more 
to reflect upon when I do it, like, an advanced A series or yeah. third series. So, so it gives you that foundation. And the foundation was definitely. And yeah. so what did you do when you came to that bit in third, and we'll see it in a minute, when it is all those arm balances one after the other, mm, mm. you know, I got tired just watching, really. <laughs> I was just thinking, oh, my God, another one? <laughs> you know, it's like, did, could, you, could you keep it going when you first started third? Were you that ready for it, or did you have to take a break? Or Well, the, this is the thing is when you're introduced to third series, you are introduced one posture at a time, adding on to uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, intermediate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're, you're slowly building up the endurance um, to then... Uh, to ultimately be able to do them in sequence. So um, in many regards, it feels as if your arms are running a marathon, most definitely. Um, uh, that part of the practice is, is probably the most sweat-inducing <laughs> part of the practice, most definitely. So with this, this aspect of adding one posture at a time, you do start to slowly adapt to the and demanding nature. And get stronger, nature. yeah, mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're doing your standing postures, before, so we'll, we'll start in a minute into the third, but when you're doing your standing postures, is your mental approach to them any different to when it's a second series day or primary day? Is there anything that you think, well, I want to work on this aspect because I know that's coming later, or mm. do you approach it any differently, or just, just okay, it's a third day? No, I, it, within, when I'm doing sun salutations, when I'm doing the standing sequence, I'm just doing it. I'm just fully immersed in the process of doing that. And I, I can't say that I'm changing anything within the standing sequence to prepare myself for the third series. Um, it's really like the kind of that same sense of, or ho hopefully that having that same sense of presence um, and, and just you know, in a way just focusing on each pose at a time while I'm doing it. Not jumping ahead, not thinking no. about what's coming up or mm -mm. that sort of thing. Oh, cool. Okay, so we'll start here, we'll start into looking at what we've got coming up. So the first posture that we approach, so you, you've come from your Pasvatanasana, mm -hmm. and then you cycle through up dog, down dog, and then we're into... Vishwamatrasana. Yeah, okay. So with this posture, you're setting up for it. Um, we. S how much importance is there in the shoulders relative to the to get that foundation first that you can build upon? Well, when you when I when I first approach the posture in downward facing position, I, I move the hand in toward the center to be aligned, and then it's uh, instead of rolling up and flying the leg up right away, there is a vinyasa there. So, just inhale, rolling open, and then when I roll open, I really have the sense of pushing through the foundational arm or the grounding arm as well as engaging my legs. Okay. Taking a breath there and then lifting the leg up. And I notice also there can be the potential for it to be more, as you roll that top hip back more, mm. it becomes more of a hip flexion than an mm. abduction taking it out to the side. Right, right. Which of those should it be? Mm. And also the, about the control in the back bend that can happen as well. Yeah, like, you know, you. When you watch different practitioners, you'll probably see kind of different expressions of this pose. For me, when I do this position, I like to really extend outward as much as possible. Right. Um, to have the sense of pushing through the floor and uh, not necessarily just, um, I like this, I guess a light sense of lightness in the body. That's what I'm always experimenting with when I do this particular position. Um, you, you, I think even other practitioners of Ashtanga, they might represent this pose a little bit differently. Like, I point the toe, sometimes people flex the toe. Right. But I like this sense of extension. So. And that and same I, sense of extension comes in the next posture. Yes. So this is Vashistasana. And um, in other traditions, sometimes those names are reversed. Right. The Vishmatrasana and Vashistasana. So here the leg is uh, placed over the shoulder as we roll open to the side. And um, again, it's, we're having to kind of open through the legs, almost kind of the same way, but in a different direction as we did in the previous posture. And what is it that stops that leg sliding down the arm? Really the sense of engaging that, that thigh and, and extending the energy out through the foot here. So I, 
when I'm doing this particular position, I'm very much engaging the leg, as well as there's a slight, there's a slight bend in the elbow too. So. Which gives it a little bit more traction yeah. on the yeah. leg. And as you're vinyasaing through, again, are you changing your breath at all when you're doing the postures, depending on the difficulty, or are you trying to maintain the same breath as you go right the way through? I think that's always the goal, is to maintain the same breath. I, is it the reality? Not always. Not always. Not always. Um, and then before we know it, we're into foot behind head, which I always think yes. is, oh my God, <laughs> how can you possibly be ready to put your foot behind your head? And now... This is Kashipasana. Yeah. Um, we're, we're laying down uh, with the leg behind the head. And um, right now, like I, I'm, b I'm bending that extending leg to kind of to get the the foot to descend down toward the floor, and then I will straighten the opposite leg. That's right. So that's a very purposeful reason for you doing that yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Because yeah. I have, you know, not all practitioners may have to do that, but uh, for me, it, it's very helpful. And it, it seems that it's very difficult to get that that what I think of almost as the standing leg flat on the ground yeah, yeah because you'd have to be so ridiculously open in the hips to get that upper body flat most definitely I mean I sometimes have my good days and bad days within that pose but it's very challenging to be super super flat in that particular position and again so as you're taking that foot behind the head you're you're hoping how far down are you hoping to get it so when I bring the leg behind the head, what's, what my main focus is to get the shoulder in front first. Okay. So to really get the shoulder forward from the leg, then pushing it back, and then taking the shin bone behind the neck. It's funny because we usually call these poses leg behind the head, but yeah. I'm always telling students, no, leg behind the neck because it lays much more comfortably. Yeah, and if it was so. behind the head, you'd have so much force pushing your head forward, your neck muscles would like mm, almost exactly. go into spasm, I imagine. Now, on a tight day, it's, it's sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to get it down that far, but it is much more comfortable um, to hold it behind. Yeah, and as I was watching you doing third, I was thinking to myself, actually, it's not just about the postures. It's about mm. all these different transitions in and out of the postures as well, mm. isn't there? There's like a special transition near enough into out of every single posture, isn't yeah. there? Which are challenging enough in themselves. Yeah, like... I mean, here you might think that the focus is more on flexibility, but with the transitions, I mean, obviously here this chakrasana takes um, a fair amount of strength as well. Um, but yeah, I find that the transitions in advance too can be rather challenging. And so this one, in a sec, when you're going to jump in for the second side again, aren't you? So we can really see that slow down and floating quality. So you, you are sort of pausing at the top before you come down, aren't you? Yeah, and again, not, I mean, that's not necessarily a requirement for every practitioner, but it's something that I like the sense of controlling the movement on the way down um, and also challenging myself to build into my strength. Um, transitions for me are, are definitely an important part of, at least in, in my own practice, um, to have this weaving in and out of the poses, the sense of mindfulness and, and using the vinyasa as a sense of strength building and, and to feel a sense of lightness in the body. And, um, and this next one coming up now? Oh, okay, so the next one is Bharivasana. So here this is like a side plank leg behind the head pose. And what are the challenges with this one relative to the ones that have come before it? So, yeah, I would say this is one of the more challenging leg behind the head poses. Sometimes, um, if I'm having a not so fluid day, there's a tendency to feel that you can't ground that the bottom leg as effectively. There is a potentiality to fall backwards. I was going to say, which is the, way, the direction of the weight wants to fall back? It looks like it might do that. Yeah. yeah. But then again, you're not finished, are you? Because it's that same strong transition exactly. out of it again. And w the, the transition in this, in this pose is rather challenging because you're having to, to swing the leg forward from a backward position and then go back into a jump back. Yeah. So it's like continually changing from, from foot behind your head to foot in front to straight leg to... 
Yeah, it, it just doesn't stop. <laughs> no, exactly. And actually the same thing when I was watching it, it was like, oh my God, there's still like another foot behind the head posture. It's like, and, and soon you're also going to be standing up, aren't you? Yes. But so we're still in that side plank position. And I remember you like to talk about the fact of, uh, of being aware of every part of the body, what every part of the body is yeah. doing. Is there something in this posture that you need to switch your awareness too that you can forget about sometimes? Yeah, I mean, just distributing the energy throughout the entire body. Um, sometimes it's, it's easy to get more focused on the leg that's behind the head and, and, and to forget even the arm that's extended. Extended. Uh, and you know, I, my, I always like to think of the whole piece, everything accounted for in the body, no stone left unturned. Um, you, you know, even with the more, in, the more intricate a pose becomes, the more important that is. And this next one you're so doing here. This is Skandasana. So, so it sort of starts similar, but then... Mm. So we're doing like a standing forward bend with the leg behind. Does that make it easier when you're folded forward than when you're laying down? I think after doing the previous pose, this is kind of like a nice break. This is a nap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's like I kind of welcome this particular pose. It's still challenging, but... Um, not as demanding as Varivasana. Yeah. So. And is it also easier than the one that's the, the, the first foot behind head one, which is with the lying down? Is that yeah, Kashupasana. So yeah. actually, that's a nice one to start with, most okay. definitely. Because um, you, you have your body weight as well as gravity kind of helping you support, and the support of the floor too, mm, as well. to help you into the position. So actually, the, the full pose here is, is taking the chin to the shin bone and actually looking toward the big toe. But that's when you're really open. Okay. You know? Like if I'm not super open, I might not, uh, I might just gaze at the nose instead. Yeah. And the, open, the opening you feel you need, is it more in the hip of the leg that's behind your head on in a good day or in the, in the back of the leg, the standing leg? No, in, in my case, I think it would be different for many practitioners, but in my case, it's usually in the hip. If okay. my hip feels a little bit crabby or a little bit tight. And this is from here. It looks, again, it starts the same, but yes. we're going to go to standing, are we? Yeah, so this is Durvasana, where we come all the way upright. So the challenge here is, is one, maintaining your balance, yeah. uh, but also keeping that standing leg as strong as possible. As straight as possible. I mean, there's always going to be a bit of a micro bend. In the and that area. again is because of the, the leg that's behind your head, isn't it? It's pulling the body weight exactly. forwards. Yeah. Mm. And so I imagine the breath wants to quicken a little bit on that. Oh, posture. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's always going to be <laughs> uh, that potential to happen. But. Uh, um, that's one that if, if I feel my, my, my breath going a little bit more rapid, I, that's like a, a, a note for me to start to, to slow down the breath. Slow and, it down. Uh, not so easy in some of the arm balances, mm. but again, that, that's kind of part of the challenge to keep the breath steady. Yeah, this, this pose, it's like it either really goes in the way that you want it, or sometimes it can go really wrong <laughs> if you and like. It, it, must be <laughs> a, your it must be a fear factor of how the hell do you save yourself as well. Because <laughs> when you're doing a Tita Hasta, it's like, okay, well, I can let go of my foot and I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. But with one stuck behind your head, it's like someone's taking one of your legs off, isn't oh, it? It's yeah. like sawing a leg. Yeah, I have had a, I've had a few interesting tumbles, but you know, nothing too crazy. Sometimes you, that leg just kind of whips out to, you know. Okay, okay, so, so it whips out to save you. Yeah. Or you've got to land on somebody soft, one or the other. And so now we're into the first of these arm balances, aren't we? Yeah. And you're jumping to a tripod headstand. Yes, yeah, so this is Urva Kukutasana A. Yeah. So usually A, you know, in, in many of the poses in Ashtanga, A is always going to be the easier. Okay. Of um, positions and then as you move into B and C a little bit more challenging. And so you, you want those arms as straight as possible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Again it would be easier if the elbows are bent. Yeah of course and um, and you know as, 
of course, not totally locking out through the elbow joint, but to, yeah, as strong as straight as possible. And then we've got B coming up. Yeah, so B, uh, from, for, at least from, from my experience, I found B to be a little bit more challenging than even C, but um, um, this can be a tricky, um, a, very, a tricky variation of Urva Kukutasana. Um, when I do it, I, I hook one knee and then lift through the other. Yes. Sometimes people can draw can, right draw. through both together. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, definitely. And again, so what are you engaging? Because, of course, there's the old friction of the legs and knees on the backs of the arms. Mm -hmm. But we really don't want that to be the thing that's keeping us up, do we? No. So the, uh, um, uh, uh, as you push down through the floor, this sense of drawing into the core is really important. And then another thing that I do, too, is, is also draw the knees in from, from my Padmasana. Yes. So, so everything drawing in toward the central axis of the body and also drawing in through my core at the same time as I press down firmly through the hands. And, and are, you f are you dorsiflexing your feet at all when you're drawing your knees in or are you just keeping them in that same orientation? I, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily flex the feet fully, but um, um, I'm kind of more just drawing the legs drawing in. Drawing the legs in together. Yeah. And then they're just sh shot back out of the Padmasana. Yeah, yes. So now is uh, Galavasana. And actually, I think this one is, I think this is one that I've even played with because it's like, it's sort of accessible in yeah. a sort of untidy fashion for a lot of people, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, you can load this up without going into headstand. Mm. So what makes this challenging is um, pressing out of a headstand when you do this particular yeah. position. Yeah, and lifting up. And what sort of angle? You're, you're heading up quite an acute angle towards the ceiling there. Is there a preferred angle if we were, like, being picky? Should it be 45 degrees or, or was that it? I would say roughly 45 degrees. I know I'm up a little bit higher because I'm... Um, for some practitioners, it's recommended to stretch through your arms as much as possible, okay. possibly getting them straight. Yeah. I'm not totally straight here, but I'm, you know, I'm practicing working in that direction. So it yeah. tends to draw everything more upward and to kind of have that balance of weight. Happen. Yeah. Mm. And so as you're watching some of these now, <laughs> are you like, are you like super critical of yourself? Yeah, there was a few things on that one I didn't <laughs> quite like. <laughs> That's a bit iffy. Yeah a sense of kind of squaring through my hips and um, activating my back leg more. Yeah. Um, I guess that's also my tendency to... Um, and I'm now this one, the, the bent knee, the mm. foot, and I've seen this in other people before as well, that the foot goes down towards the ground and then it's drawn back in close. Is again, is that done on purpose? So this is how I access this particular position. I'm, I think, you know, many practitioners, they can start with it totally bent. Right. But I, you know, where I'm working right now, because this um, Ekapada Bakasana was a very challenging pose for me, actually. It was one of the poses that I struggled with the most, among maybe a few others within the sequence. So I found this to be highly challenging, working into my strength yeah. and to find the balance. And so the knee is supposedly in the armpit yeah, rather so than on the back of the arm. Well, y yeah, you want it as high up on, the, on, the, on your arm as possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is Ekapada Bakasana B. So we have one leg bent and the other leg extended, kind of going over in the direction of the shoulder. And that looks a little bit more accessible than the ones that came before. Is oh, yeah, right? yeah. I, yeah. It's if still you've got challenging. a good titibasana, maybe? Yeah, yeah, still challenging, but you're not holding so much body weight over the arms here. You have the support of the leg hanging over the upper arm and whatnot. So. And I could really see a lot of work going into that straight leg, a lot of work pushing out through the toes and creating a really strong leg. Yeah, and that's something that I always... Like I keep mentioning, this sense of the energy, in a way, kind of radiating from like Mula Bana and Uriana Bana out through my limbs and having it kind of just um, be an extension of my Banda going 
going out through my toes, even out, sometimes out through the fingertips, depending on what type of position it is. So now we're into Kundanyasana. So the, both of the legs are stacked the, and uh, the legs energized. And again, if you've got a, a good amount of hip flexion, yeah. this is a bit of a, a breeze again, is it, compared and to the other ones? And also twisting. Hmm. If you, um, I remember there was one time where on one side I was quite a bit tighter twisting, and I found it so challenging, more challenging on one side versus the other. To get in the right position to do it. Yeah, because you want the, the thighs to come high up on the arms as possible. So that demands a fair amount of twisting. And f at this stage, you've been doing quite a few now, jumping into the arm balance. Yes. So are you having to drag on the reserves? Is oh, it like yeah. I, you, at this point, you're really feeling it. Um, the, the arms start to, to fatigue a bit. Right. And, um, or what, the, what is that? You start to feel kind of the lactic acid. Lactic acid working. and a bit of muscle, as you say, muscle fatigue. Yeah. But these are really beautiful postures. Again, this is something I've had a mess with. You know, uh, but it's such a fantastic feeling, some of these ones. I don't know why, because you're going in so many different directions yeah. at once. Yeah, the energy and the, you know, and it is, you know, arm balances can be fun. You know, there's a, there's a sense of your potentiality coming out, that sense of like... Um, there's a playfulness to yeah, them as well, isn't there? Most definitely, hmm. yeah. It doesn't always feel so playful when you're, <laughs> when doing, you're doing them. them. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it is, it is, but... You, when you do them in sequence like this, that's the challenge. I yeah. mean, many, many practitioners can, can access these poses like on an individual. On a one-off, yes. Yeah, like doing one at a time. But when you do them in sequence, that is what makes it quite challenging and, and, and um, demands a different type of focus and concentration. Okay, so now Asavakrasana A. So this is where we build it from headstand. Yes, coming through. And that's tricky enough, isn't it, to get one leg under, one leg over in a controlled way. Yeah. Yeah, this is quite tricky, the transition going into it and keeping the feet off the floor. I saw you pause there on the back, like in a bakasana before you go through. Yeah, like it's a sense of like kind of containing my body, containing the legs. And um, when I work with arm balances, I don't like to go into them sloppy. Right. You know, I want to be, because it demands quite a bit of strength, I want to feel kind of sense of mindfulness as I enter into the poses. And uh, when I do that, it just feels more contained. And at this stage, is it harder, is it more work going into the posture or more work coming out as far as that transition goes? Oof. I think for this one is Asavakrasana B jumping into. I find that coming out of it is very challenging right. because you've already held it for five breaths, and that jumping out um, demands a lot of this extra power after you've held the pose. And so the difference, because I was when I was watching this, I was thinking, what was the difference between this one and the one before? So between A and B, or yes, you just so have to go straight through. Yeah. So with A, we we built it from a headstand. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's what it was. And then with B, we jump into the pose and then jump out after the five breath count. As we were filming this, I had the camera there from this was the clo This was my angle that I was shooting from, and Nick was on the other angle. But I was sort of trying to skimmy to the side of the camera so as I get a proper view rather than looking through the lens. Because it was like, <laughs> okay, this is like getting a good appreciation of the amount of work that's going on here by uh, seeing you with, with, without seeing you through the camera lens. And uh, yeah, so now we could, it was at this stage I could say, yeah, there was a fan on, wasn't there, in the background. And oh, I, was, yeah. we were, I think we were both thinking, thank God the fan was on. No, that was, that was my saving grace because. After the arm balances, you really start to build up a healthy sweat, yeah. that's for sure. And then now we're into Puna Matsandrasana. So this is kind of a part where it does dip down a little bit after the arm balances. So this is always a welcome pose um, where you feel like you can kind of collect your strength. And, and, and where we have in the second, we had Bharavadrasana and Ardhamatsyandrasana. Yeah. It's like counter postures to the backbend bit. Right. Are these sort of count, is that how they're thought? Why are they placed in this position? You know, I can't really, uh, um, 
the way that I feel is like we've we've just done um, a quite a, a quite a few arm balances. So now, in a way, we're kind of gearing ourselves to go into a deeper back bend. Right. So I feel like you know there's a few of these poses here that's kind of getting us back to a sense of grounding and uh, centering um, after all of that kind of upper body work that we did in um, the arm balances. And, and seeing you doing this, you're, you're still maintaining all your nice clean jumps in and out. Um, of course, I'm thinking of my own practice. When the going gets tough, I wimp out and just do a couple of fluffs for us. <laughs> so, what is it that keeps you mentally tough to keep going like that? Well, I just, just one pose at a time. Right. Just not really thinking about the whole mountain I need to climb, but just each step I need to take. And when I do that, I feel like I'm able to pull from my reserve. And, uh, and, and there's sometimes when I start the practice, I'm like, Ugh, I don't know if I have enough energy to, to get through it. But I just, when I just think one pose at a time, it just seems to carry me through. Through the whole thing. Yeah, and to stay relaxed, too. Like, even though this particular sequence demands a fair amount of energy, um, I am always talking myself to just move into a state of relaxation. And this next posture coming up now. All right, so now we have uh, Viranchasana A. So this is where we bring the, uh, the left leg into half lotus, the right leg behind the head. And breathe here for five breaths. And this is the one, yes. I thought, well, that looks nice. <laughs> and then it just went on, didn't it? It's yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a few steps to, to, this. to this particular uh, position. This one is sometimes I have trouble with, too, because like, after the arm balances, you feel a sense of tightness through the shoulders. Right, of course. So you have to bind um, your hands behind the back over the leg. So the, Yes, because yeah. we can't see it from this angle. But the, the hands are going the other side of the leg, aren't they? Not between the leg and the back, but over the top over of the, the leg. Yeah, over the top. Yeah. And I think in this moment, I was having trouble. I was slipping. I was sweating a bit. And right, <laughs> <I was laughs> trying to have gripping. I was having trouble gripping my hands. But uh, sometimes that's part of it. So once you get the grip, it's a bit of a relief, actually. And then here we, we um, bring the half lotus leg behind the arm and breathe for five breaths. And those arms, they must be so tired at this point. Oh yeah, you definitely, you feel it, you feel it. Again, why, another reason why it's important to you, when you're learning to just adding on one pose at a time. One at a time, then you're gonna build up the stamina, as you say, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I was looking at the sequence and thinking, oh my God, how could you just keep going, going, <laughs> going? Yeah. And of course, then there's always, when there's one side, there's always a second side, isn't there? That's the thing. And do you have a tighter side? Do you have one side that is always more challenging for you than the other? Yeah, I'm always, um, my right side is always kind of my weaker, tighter side. And so um, that's something that I've had for, for quite a few years now. Um, so it does, it does affect the way, that, how you feel essentially in the practice. Um, but with that being said, I do my best to, to, to feel a sense of equanimity between both sides and not to allow my left side to overpower the right. Um, and is, it in, is that in most postures or, or relative to foot behind head and that sort of thing? In most postures, even in strength bearing postures, I feel that I'm a bit stronger through my left side. Ah, interesting. Yeah. That foot behind your head here in this position, does it make it harder to balance than when you were in the full Padmasana with your legs in the same position. Was it Kundinyasana? I probably got the name wrong. Were you in so full, full Padnasana, but both knees were up in the armpits and the legs were straight? This one, uh, that, I would find, th this pose, when you're, when you're holding yourself up, you're locked in. Right. It, it, it does, I mean, it is challenging, but it, it, it's a little easier than it looks right. because of the way you're kind of locked in into the legs, like the le one leg behind the head and the other one kind of bracing behind the arm. So now we have Viranchasana B. Okay, so this next one that we're again jumping through into, what yep. have we done with the foot there? So it's almost like you're putting it into a, um, uh, a 
Janusz Szasmus C. Yes. And then, but then we roll all the way over. Over the top, the which looks particularly nasty, really, from an anatomical <laughs> yeah, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's a deflection in the knee as well. Um, and it's not the most comfortable feeling on the foot, but then you do get used to it over time. Okay. And so the first part of it is we're kind of rounding the back a bit, drawing the lower belly in, and dropping the head. And then the second part is grabbing the wrist and folding into the pose. And so the energy, yes, because I remember looking at that first part and then thinking, well, what is she doing there? Why mm. is she r up? Yeah. So energetically, you're deliberately trying to create a bit more of a curve. Yes, yes. And here we've, you've taken that foot in the same position, isn't it? Right, so I, I maintain that... The, the rolling over the foot, and then I take the extended leg and put it into a half lotus position here. And again, the transition out, one foot is in the heart. That, it's that, if anybody's tried to do that lift in a tuck yeah. with just the legs drawn, but not crossed to the chest, yeah. it's like super difficult, isn't it? But there you've got one also in Padmasana which yeah. must make you want to open up a bit, does it? Yeah, so there's a sense of me really pressing down through the hands and drawing the, um, drawing the legs in. And um, demands quite a bit of strength to kind of just press yourself out of that particular... Out of that particular position. Yeah. And so here, yeah, this is this rounded position. And so here you're drawing up in the bandas and... Yes, dropping the chin... And uh, here we breathe for five breaths. So yeah, there's a sense of rounding. And then the second part, catching the wrists and folding, doing like a forward bend. A forward bend. Into the position. And the channel, where are you feeling it in your own body when you're doing this? I think the, the, where I feel it the most is definitely in the foot. The foot that's yeah. underneath your bottom. Yeah. And the coming out, I, c I can see you go nice and and well, you come out in a minute, don't you? First of all, you're doing the, the bind. But when you come out in a sec, I see you go nice and slow. Yeah, I, I mean, again, just kind of collecting your energy and just staying with a nice rhythm. I, I don't like to put in too much aggressive energy into this particular sequence because, or any sequence really, you know, um, but it's especially in third series because of the demanding nature of, of the postures. Um, and the fact that it really works into the strength and um, a lot of stamina um, is generated throughout the, the sequence of these poses. So um, it's, I, I find that in third series it's important to, to collect yourself and to stay in the breath and to stay steady. Uh, because, it, like I mentioned earlier, there there are a few moments in the practice where I really feel like I'm vibrating. Right. You know, and then I, it's important that I stay calm and, um, and in my breath um, as I move through the sequence. And so now we're back on our head, but we're back to go over the top, aren't we? Yeah, so this is Viparita Dandasana. So we're lowering the feet down toward the floor. And I tend to do this slowly to kind of like coax my, my back open because this is the first back bend that we do in the, in the sequence. So this is such a nice chest and shoulder opener. It looks very like Purva Tanasana, apart from the fact that you're in headstand. Yeah, yeah, it? it really does. It really does. This could be a challenging part to jump yourself back over and then into Chaturanga Dandasana. And does that feel like a bit of a relief, that, that movement of the back after having done all the rest of the stuff that you've been doing? Are you looking forward to that first back bend? Although I know back bends are not necessarily your favorite. <laughs> no, it, they're, they, are, they aren't really my favorite. When I do the first one, I do feel resistance. Um, but when I do the second one, uh, Ekapada, uh, Viparita um, Dandasana, that uh, my back feels a little bit more coaxed open, and it, the second one tends to feel better. Feel nicer. Yeah. And it's so great that there's two opportunities, even though it's a different variation, to have two opportunities to do it, just to get an extra chest and shoulder opening through here. 
And when you were learning these postures one at a time, mm -hmm. would you repeat them X number of times to get the hang of certain ones, or would you stick to just De one-offs? Definitely, yes. I w repeating is, is something that I, I have done in the past with poses that I found to be extra challenging for me. So usually anywhere from the realm of doing them twice or possibly three times, usually no more than that, um, uh, just to kind of keep the rhythm of the practice going. But sometimes, you know, it, you have to work, workshop things and, and give more time and kind of garner a deeper understanding of the pose, um, especially if it doesn't come so naturally. There's a bit of a build-up to this one, so we can see. <laughs> yes, so this was the Farita Shalabhasana. Not my favorite pose. And we were talking a little bit about this one after, as to whether the challenge here is range of motion, or psychological, or strength. How is it for you? Obviously, it's going to be different for other peop for different people, depending on where they are. Yeah, I mean, because my back can feel rather temperamental at times, sometimes this pose feels absolutely amazing. It feels so great to get that opening through the chest and through the spine. Other times, it feels uh, rather challenging or, you know, especially if I have resistance in my back. And Sometimes if you don't have such a good day, also the pressure that you kind of feel like kind of resting on the neck is uh, not the, the best feeling. But over time, we really want to send more of the, um, the energy and the weight into the chest. So how much of the chest should be in contact with the floor as you're coming over as the top? As much as you can while right. staying upright. Um, if you, of course, if you lean back too much and the legs may want to draw back, and, and they'll be out of balance. Um, but especially for the next pose, um, Ganda Burandasana, it's especially important to, to bring the weight back on the chest um, for it to feel more comfortable through the neck as you prepare to, to bind. So you start the same way. Yes. But the objective is, so with the, with the first version, you sort of stopped almost here, didn't you? Or a little bit higher. Yes. And now this version. I'm bringing I'm bringing the toes down, bending the legs to 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 grab them. And this this is not my favorite part <laughs> of the <laughs> because the when you prepare for Ganda Buddha and Dasana, grabbing the feet, at least in my experience, is kind of the most demanding part of setting the pose up. Once you grab the feet, then you feel secure. In the, in the pose, and, you, and even though it's quite opening and demands quite a bit of flexibility, I find that the transition to grab the feet to be kind of the most stressful part. That's what it seemed like watching as well, that mm -hmm. once you'd got your feet, you were settled. Yes. But there was a lot of effort going into maintaining your position while you took hold of your feet. Yes, yeah. And that's something, you know, uh, grabbing my feet is, st is still something that I struggle with sometimes. It doesn't always come so naturally. So here we have Hanumanasana. And this must be like, oh, thank <laughs> God, it's like something that involves just a bit of an old split. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is like a nice uh, kind of part of the practice where uh, you can kind of relax a little bit. But it's, what's funny, after I do Ganam Bodhandasana, and then when I fold forward in this position, I can just feel my toes vibrating. You can fit, so this is where you feel, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, that's been a really strong back bend, hasn't it? Yeah, it's something, it really activates the nervous system. So when I come into Hanumanasana, it's like, it's a great pose to come afterwards because it feels more grounding, especially when you fold forward. But is, is there a, the off chance that you might just almost physically sigh because you've like done that really, really tough bit and, and lose the concentration because this one mm. is, is easy. Of course, it's not easier if you haven't got the, the length on the back of the leg and the front of the other leg, but, yeah. <laughs> but relative to, I mean, you're, you're doing uh, advanced day, as we say, so it's going to be there. Um, is there a, is a chance that you can just sort of let go at that point and you start drifting or not? No, I hear what you're saying. Mm. I mean, this is something that I experience always. After, in, 
in my experience, Ghana Bro and Dasna is the most challenging for me personally. And a lot of times before I start, uh, when I start to, be or when I begin a uh, third series, I'm sometimes I'm thinking about it. So mm -hmm. when I do it and I, it actually worked out uh, and wasn't too much of a struggle, it's a big relief. Um, but again, you know, maintaining that sense of kind of steadiness throughout the practice is, is obviously important. But there's always kind of a little bit of drama happening on the inside, you know. But yeah. I think what's important that you don't show it too much on the on outside. On the outside. But know? that's what I was saying to the <laughs> beginning, that you will, will look, you know, you're so graceful as you're doing it coming in and out. And that you really can't get the full appreciation of, of the amount of work that's going on, really, when you're watching the video. Yeah. So maybe we need, um, like, a, a sniffer sense or something, or something yeah, yeah. we can bundle <laughs> with the video to give you a sense of the amount of hard work that's been going on. Yeah, I, that's always the interesting part of... I mean, even in, in, in primary series and in intermediate series, there's some points of challenge and some points that are some postures that become more natural and, and feel more easy to flow into. And, and having that sense of equanimity and steadiness throughout all those challenges is, is another kind of muscle to work uh, mentally in the practice. And so this one is? This is Trivikramasana, or Supta Trivikramasana. So, Laying, essentially, we're laying down doing the splits, yeah. but we're we're getting we're accessing the open of the the openness of the legs by by pulling on the leg and pulling it toward the opposite or toward the shoulder. Actually. Towards the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen here if you're not aware? I can see that the hips want to shimmy to the side, and the, the what is, I always think of as the standing leg wants to roll out to the yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So keeping that um, the extended leg active is really important. Um, not letting it go. I mean, of course, you want to be relaxed, but you don't want it to to go too loose, mm. so it ha so it doesn't have a tendency to roll out. So now we're going into Dugasana, which, believe it or not, this is, I don't like this pose. I just, <laughs> it's a very, for some reason, I find it's a simple pose, but I find it very challenging. And is it because of everything that's come before it, or is it, you know, it's deceptively simple, maybe? Well, um, for me, I, I have a little bit of, sometimes I have a little bit of weakness through the back. And sometimes I, I, I have trouble with the balance in this particular, this particular pose. I don't know. It's a, I don't know why I find this pose so challenging, but I feel it mostly in my back right. when I do it. And I mean, for this particular practice, I was quite shaky in it. Some days it goes quite smooth, other days not so smooth. But I think that's really nice for people to see that it's not always a walk in the park. No, that it's no, a, like, no. It is a work in progress, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it is a practice. It's, you know, some, it's not a performance, you know. It's just some days it flows, other days it doesn't flow so much. Yeah, and that's quite, that's quite important. As you say, it's not a performance. It, because we videoed you doing it, yeah. it can look like a performance, but we videoed you doing your practice. Yes. So it's, it is what you're going through and what you're experiencing at this moment in your practice, isn't it? Most definitely, most definitely. So here's Trivi Kramasana, so doing the standing split. So essentially doing our best to keep that standing leg as straight as possible while extending the, the opposite leg up in the, kind of in the direction of the, the shoulder there, or to the side of the, the head. To the side of the head. So here is uh, Natrajasana. And there's a, a, a little bit of a tricky transition, isn't there, from, from that to Yeah, so here. bringing the leg to the front, out to the side, and then gripping the foot. So then, 
and then of course extend up into it's like a standing back bend essentially. Yeah. It's interesting here because in this pose, I I tend to struggle more on my right side, which it was um, a little bit shaky there. Yeah, this left side for, seemed m more fluid, more easier for you to get into. Yeah, like I, it's just, oh, you know, it's always a little stronger, a little bit stronger than my right. And because you are on that standing leg for quite a time, aren't you, as well? So yeah, from so the transition from the front to the back, back to the side again. Yeah, for, the, for when you transition, it, it it's building stamina through that standing leg because you're holding it for for quite a while there. So here's Raja Kapotasana. Again, at this moment, my back was not so open for this particular <laughs> pose. Um, this pose, some days it's super easy, other days it just is not so easy. So here I'm coaxing myself doing some extra vinyasa <laughs> to get myself Just into to give it a little bit. Yeah, to get myself into the pose. Yeah. So it's where the toes, is that as it should look now after a bit of coaxing? Yeah, yeah, mm. so the feet coming to the head as we you know, open through the chest, shoulders back, head back. And then here's Ekapada, Raja Kapotasana. And here, the foot is deliberately brought back towards the groin, isn't it, that front leg, rather than having it parallel to the front of the mat, whereas you sometimes do pigeon like yes. that. Yes, yes. And also even um, as you, after you grab the foot, drawing the elbows together. It always looks like one of the most sort of graceful postures, I think. Oh, it looks really nice and releasing, but to try and, depending on, of course, how open you are, I'm thinking of myself, but to try <laughs> and get that back foot even off the floor to actually get hold of it. It's a very nice back bend. Um, in my body, I, I really feel it through the shoulders, mm. especially through my chest and in that back thigh, too. It's a nice way to end third series, actually. So this is the last pose. This is the last mm -hmm. pose, and then it would go into our normal finishing yes. sequence. So going into Udvadhanarasana, which, you know, having the the back bends more at the second half of the of the sequence, it's quite nice when you start to move into the back bends and. Um, into the other portion of the backbending sequence. So you sort of remember them a little bit more than, than when, like with the second series, they're right up the front, aren't they? Yes. And then you've done all this other stuff, and then you start again, don't you? Yeah, yeah, so it's quite, it's quite different um, where the backbends are placed. So at this point, I, I'm feeling quite open to go into Udvadhanarasana. And, but you still build the scale as you go up rather than go for your deepest on the first. first. I do, and that's just is something I've learned from experience. And, and like I mentioned, because of the temperament of my back, I, I, I coax my back open. I just don't, I don't jam into don't it jam as fast it. as possible, which, you know, nobody should really do, you yeah. know, even if they're flex, hyper flexible. But I like to tap into my strength and... Um, feel as much space through my low back as much as possible. So that's why I kind of set up in the way that I do. And what are the challenges here for you? Because obviously we can see you've got a high back bend, but what do you have to control? What are the bits of your body that you've, you're focusing on not letting them do what they want necessarily? Well, I mean, uh, keeping the legs active and not allowing um, my inner thighs to pop out too much. To, to continue this sense of the dropping down of the inner thighs. That's really, imp that's something that I'm continually focused on improving in my back bends. In your own back bends. Yeah. And of course, it's relevant for a lot of people as well. And minimum amount of movement in the feet turning out there as you're dropping back 
which is what we see, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of people, isn't it? So t legs, just feet can go like way out, almost yeah. like flippers. Yeah, and I, the, and my, if I were to not put a lot of focus on my feet, they would really want to naturally go out quite mm. a bit. Um, I think just observing me, I was a little bit turned out, but that's something that over time I've been doing my best to improve upon and keeping the feet as parallel as possible um, through the course of doing the dropbacks. And then we start into... Into TikToks. Yeah. Do they have a proper name or not? I call them TikToks. Some people call them Tic Tacs. Yeah, I call them Tic Tacs. So but I <laughs> wondered if there was some sort of Sanskrit name for them or whether they just sort of thrown in there. Oh, yeah. Like, it's Viparita Chakrasana, I believe. Right. Don't quote me on that because <laughs> now I'm like, oops, I think uh -oh. I forgot the, the Sanskrit name for this. But I think that's what it's called. Because it's like everything yeah. else we use the proper name. When it yes. comes to this, it's just Tic Tacs. You know, it's like no, I think it's Viparita Chakrasana. Right. Chakrasana. Chakrasana, Viparita ch Chakrasana. I'll double check on that one though. <laughs> <laughs> and the challenge is you've got to control that handstand before you start lowering down into the. So back when bend. I prepared for um, the Tic Tacs, I think one thing that's important is keeping the legs um, engaged um, so they don't go too loose and uncontrolled. And also keeping the head lifted. Because you know, when you lift the chin and lift the head, it puts the brakes on the movement. And that's really important. So it's not so, so uncontrolled as you sh start to shift your body weight. Yeah, and we can, we can see you purposefully slow it down. Because oh, yeah. it, it can sort of be up and over, kind of, in like a... Whereas you're almost not pausing, but there, it's like you could pause at any cho chosen moment. You could stop where you are. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I would challenge practitioners to, to, to work into their strength and slow down the movement as much as possible. And in a sense, when you do that, the legs act as a weight and also help to open the body. So if you just haul yourself over as quickly as possible, you don't have that opportunity to open through the spine, open through the chest, through the shoulders. When you work slowly, I find that I get a deeper opening as well. And then I'm always big on really opening the palms of the hands nice and wide as well. Sometimes people talk about a, a hand band, uh, like a, a cupping of yeah. the hand. Do you work with that yourself? I mean, I, I tend to really spread out wide and then ground through the pads with my fingers. Right. And I, many teachers and practitioners explain it in different ways, but that you do feel a sense there's a, like an arch. Mm. Um, in the hand, just like there's an arch in your foot. Mm. And this again for me, after all those arm balances and things, to oh draw yeah. on the strength yet again for the handstands and for the coming over. And that's why I rely on technique. Yeah. You know, technique gets me through when I am tired. Always, you know, anything weight-bearing, working into the central axis of the body, drawing in through the core, feeling grounded. Um, when you feel the sense of the body fatiguing a bit, it's, the technique is always what carries me through. Because otherwise it, ca it can, it can get sloppy, can't it? Those oh are the yeah. times as you get tired mm, mm. that the technique goes out the window if you're not careful, doesn't it? Yeah, so yeah, when, when tired, I draw upon that technique even more. And it, it doesn't come from a place of trying to push into it. It's, in a sense, just being more mindful and relaxing into uh, the alignment of the pose or, or grounding um, wh where you need to ground and um, kind of drawing on your reserve. And with this one now, is this where, if you had an assistant or if you were yeah. so open, that you would then take your heels? Yeah, so having um, um, a teacher or someone support me um, through three halves. Yeah. And then having them take me to my ankles or possibly higher on a, on a more open day. Right. Yeah. And then we're, we've really, as you say, we, we sort of 
finished sort of third, because okay. that, that same process of the tic tacs you could add on at the end of second. Is there anything extra in there that wouldn't be no, after no, no. second? No, so that would the be same. there, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the same backbending sequence. So um, in the backbending sequence, we do uh, three Udva Dhanurasanas, three backbends, or drop backs, I should say. Um, then we go through the, the tic tacs where we're going back and forth three times and then up over and stand and then up over and stand three times, and then on the fourth, we do Vrishikasana, bringing the feet to the head and balancing. Yeah. yeah. So that in itself is, is rather demanding. So. Like the finale. Yeah, it is the finale. <laughs> and so at this stage, I mean, I felt relief for you, even if you didn't feel it for yourself. <laughs> it was like, oh, we're coming into finishing. And, and so we'll... we'll as I said to the guys, that they can watch the whole video, you know, from the, from the standing, right from the opening prayer all the way to the end and, and see the finishing sequence in there. Mm. But um, thanks so much for spending your time and doing this talk over of yeah. all the points that we've been going through. Yeah, thank you so much. And I uh, hope we catch you again next season and we'll um, look forward to talking about some other stuff with you. Yeah, sounds wonderful. Thank thanks you, so Stu. Thanks so much.